Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the pleasure to talk to you about social behavior. And this is going to be part one of a two-part video series uh, on social behavior. Social behavior is uh, really, really interesting, and I think one of the things that makes it intriguing for us when we, we look at examples of social behavior between organisms, and social behavior is defined as an interaction between organisms, between two or more sort of in a group, usually in the same species. I think the things that make social behavior interesting is that we can relate to them because uh, the human species is quite social and these interactions are rather important to us. Let's get right into that conversation. And so when I say important, when I say important, I mean that we rely on each other in a group in order to be most successful. And when I say most successful, I mean to survive and ultimately to have a greater reproductive output or greater fitness. Now, a lot of times we don't go into social behavior with this necessarily on the front of our mind, but ultimately the ultimate cause of social behavior is rooted in evolution. But I might add all behaviors rooted in evolution. But there's proximal causes. There's reasons in the short term that will allow social behavior to be beneficial, but let, let there be no mistake. Ultimately, it's natural selection and evolution. And so social behavior, let's, let's jump right into this. One of my favorite uh, examples of social behavior is cooperation. Uh, you might have heard, if, if you know me personally, you might have know uh, that this is my favorite quote of all, <laughs> of all time, which is, for the strength of the wolf, is the pack and the strength of the pack is the wolf and so this embodies social interaction and cooperation in particular in other words if you try to go it alone you're not going to be successful sometimes things like um, hyenas can't bring down prey unless they work as a group or wolves have to hunt in a pack or if you look down here these pelicans are unsuccessful when they work individually and so this is kind of uh, sport, sporting teams like to embody this notion of cooperation. And I think the whole idea of sport itself, the idea of practicing uh, through play is what we're actually practicing is cooperation. So we're trying to instill these tendencies or, or and try to instill this type of teamwork. And so sometimes you hear the expression, there's no I in team. And so this is where it's coming from. So if we can work together, we're far more successful than individually. And so this is encouraged. In other words, this behavior of getting along and working as a team is highly selected in a social environment. And so uh, now not every uh, social behavior is a positive one, like cooper being cooperative. Sometimes there is some competitive social behaviors that come into play. And so organisms in a group could be fighting over something. They can be fighting over mates. They could be fighting over food and so resources. And so in order to get through that, it, in, instead of having like battles, in other words, physical uh, fights with, with organisms in your group, which could lead to... Um, loss of energy it could lead to being hurt or even if you feel like you could win the fight you could be damaged in the fight and that could weaken you or you could accidentally be hurt by physically fighting and so what organisms do in a social uh, environment is sometimes they have what are called agonistic behavior and agonistic b behavior sort of looks on the surface like it's a fight but it's really uh, uh, threats and uh, pretending to be biting. Like if you might have seen dogs do this or wolves where they're, do you see how this one dog right here is, is looking to bite, or wolf is looking to bite this other one. It isn't really doing it. It's basically exerting itself in terms of its physical prowess, but it's intimidating and it's hoping to back down its opponent. And so the opponent it then becomes more submissive. So it's kind of ritualistic. It's, it's, um, 
it's pretending to bite, it's howling, it's gesturing, it's, it's sort of giving this the snake eye, agonistic behavior. Generally, generally, there's no harm done in this. And so it's kind of like wrestling in, in terms of, here, let me, let me give you an example of this before I move on. Um, I think what's really interesting is, I may have described it, but again, I think seeing agonistic behavior is a little bit better than words. And so here we have wolves are a classic example of this. And so check this out. Okay, th this, this wolf obviously is very upset uh, and it's maybe howling and okay. And so a fight is uh, ensuing. And so do you notice how it isn't really too violent? It's kind of ritualistic, okay? There's some, you know, tail between the, the legs. And so they're, 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 you know, fighting, but again, not a lot of harm is going on. And so this one is like, okay, get back, get back. And so this one seems to be the winner. And so he reinforces it with a howl. And so like, take a look here. Let me back that up a little bit. And you're like, well, what, what were they fighting over? And so interestingly enough, you can tell by the environment that it looks like it's cold and snowing. And so maybe resources are limited. It looks like they're fighting over this carcass. Now, what's interesting to me, it's like, okay, here's the winner, but take a look. There's two of these wolves over here. And so one might think that these two could take that one, but in fact, this is the winner. And so both of them back down. And so what's interesting is, um, agonistic behavior again is very ritualistic. And so it works. And so it's, it, it's competitive. Um, uh, and it results in submissive behavior. And so ultimately, if you get into a conflict, though, in society, it's not good to sort of harbor and maintain that, that those hostile feelings with one another. And again, you have to, when there's a conflict, you don't have to, but it's encouraged to have reconciliation. In other words, forgiveness. In other words, we have to get along with people. And so temporally speaking, you could be in a fight with an organism or, or a friend or something, but then in the end, you have to get over it. And so reconciliation happens usually between conflicting individuals because uh, ultimately uh, time passes and there, there needs to be uh, moving on. And so that's an interesting thing. I wanna talk a little bit about dominance hierarchies. And so you've, made, you've probably familiar with this. It's, it's when individuals in a group are ranked, usually linear, like what, like number one, number two, number three, and it's not usually called one, two, three. It's usually uh, letters of the alphabet or pecking order, like alpha number is the number one, the top dog, if you will, the alpha, or beta is the number two. And so you might think, you know, this is kind of interesting because the alpha, the leader, if you will, controls the behavior of the others. And so leadership in general is really an important thing to develop in a society. If everybody has equal say, I might, I might, you might think that this is, you know, well, this is great. Everybody can contribute, but ultimately there needs to be someone who makes a decision so that the group can just follow it. And so ultimately it's more successful when there is sort of a governmental uh, decision-making society going on. And so this is what we, what comes up with this dominant hierarchy. And so usually it's known between like baboons or chimpanzees or wolves wolves or chickens, most notably. And so this pecking order helps to maintain order. So if you're the alpha, if you will, the alpha male, you get to, usually you're the strongest and you're the, uh, you know, physically maybe the smartest, if you will. And so females are going to want to mate. And so with that alpha, and so that alpha gets to mate. And so theoretically the, the genes of the best male get to move along from generation to generation. It doesn't mean that you're alpha forever. If you get sick, you could be replaced by the beta, or if you're injured in a fight um, over, over dominance, you could be replaced, or even when you get older, you can be replaced. And so it's kind of an interesting thing, dominant hierarchies. And so here's another social behavior, territoriality. And so territory is really important. In other words, where you're living, your habitat, it's crucial because in your range, this is where you're getting your food. This is where you're raising your offspring. This is where you're um, finding your mate. This is where you're reproducing. And so 
the more territory you have, the better chances you have going for you in terms of survival and reproductive output. <clears throat> but there's limits to this. It's like, uh, how much territory does an organism need? And in doing so, you have to be able to defend that territory. So again, this is like a trade-off. If you recall our discussion of optimal foraging, you don't want to go too far and have like, I want to have all this territory. Uh, it's difficult to defend. It puts a lot of energy into that. And so it's rather important to have territory. And so organisms will fight. They're, they're, um, they're in competition for territory. As you can see, these birds next to each other are so valuing their their territory in order to raise their offspring that they're experiencing a uniform pattern of dispersion if you notice that now what are they fighting over you know you can fight territory could again be over feeding rights or mating or uh, raising your children and so what's fascinating as i mentioned before is that there's some drawbacks to having a territory and maintaining a large territory there's a lot of energy that goes into it and so you spend time defending it and sort of like on patrol and you might miss an opportunity to mate if you're out on patrol guarding your territory you might actually die in the out there and so sometimes animals have developed some interesting strategies instead of uh, patrolling their territory what they might want to do uh, excuse me for this what they might want to do is actually mark their area and so as you can see here the cheetah is marking its territory by urinating. And again, organisms that have a, a better olfactory uh, sense, in other words, the ability to smell, can note the fact that another animal's been there and that it's marking its territory, and usually there's respect for that. It's a funny thing, uh, it's not so funny, but it's interesting, you might be able to relate that even humans uh, tend to, in, in groups, sometimes we call them gangs, but we'll, we'll mark territories by uh, using spray paint and that sort of thing and sort of tag an area. And so what's interesting is, you know, why would a gang do that? Because it's sort of, sort of their territory. It's where they're getting their stuff done. I'm not sure what it is that they're doing, but it, spraying uh, behavior is something that uh, organisms do to mark their territory so they don't have to be on patrol constantly. And so this social <laughs> behavior is a real important one. Courtship behavior is, is such a classic in, in, ani in animal behavior in general. And it's what organisms do. And, you know, when we talk about courtship, ultimately we want to mate with, with the opposite sex, but it's like, it's not so easy to do it. You have to court. In other words, you have to um, get the other uh, gender to be interested in you. And so sometimes, as you can see here, even in fruit flies, this, this occurs, believe it or not. I mean, you may not have noticed courtship behavior in fr fruit flies before, but it, it happens. So there's a little orientation. Sometimes they, uh, they throw out their wings and vibrate it and they follow the female around. And there's all kinds of, uh, things that ensue. Let me show you, uh, I actually have a video of courtship behavior. I'm not sure if you're surprised by that because I, I, I'm capable. <laughs> but I, take a look at this video on, uh, on courtship in fruit flies. I think you might think it's funny. At the top of the fly with the spots. And that's a little dance that he does in front of the female while he's pursuing her in courtship. So species that have these spots at the edges of their wings engage in this courtship display. So if you see this male at the bottom is extending his pigmented wing, sort of in a matador sort of approach, sticking out its left wing. She seems to be paying attention. Hmm. <laughs> she maybe was not as impressed as she should have been. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> now, I know you're all laughing, but, you know, I, I have... Uh, teenagers and I've been to some of your dances and <laughs> yeah you know it, it's funny but I th I think there's a lot of truth in that like humans really display a lot in terms of courtship rituals and so this is fairly common throughout the animal kingdom and it goes into birds as well this is one of the famous courtship rituals that you can find uh, 
in a bird called an albatross. And so here are um, two albatross uh, exhibiting courtship behavior. And sometimes it's called a ritual because it happens fairly similarly each time. And it's, it's hard to know exactly what they're getting at, but it is a courtship ritual. And these are albatross that are found on the Galapagos Islands, just west of Ecuador in the Pacific Ocean. So there's no, there's no sound to this, but there's some hooping and hollering here. And then what looks to be kissing <laughs> that's occurring between the birds. And then they sort of weave their necks back and forth like this. And so they're like smooching. It's really unusual. And so um, if you wanted to, you could YouTube uh, albatross courtship ritual. And, and uh, there's some interesting sound that goes along with this ritual as well. But I, I find this to be pr pretty interesting. One of the more interesting courtship rituals. I mean, there's, there's many, as it turns out. And so one of the things, um, let's go back to, the, to this. One of the things that I want to point out is that um, it's really, really interesting when you consider what birds are capable of doing. I mentioned this particular bird, whoops, I mentioned this bird in a, in a previous video, but I'll bring it up again. It's called a bower bird. And this bower bird, this male bower bird, goes about courtship in a, in a really unusual way. Usually it involves dancing or some sort of display of physical prowess. Look at me, how beautiful I am, and a flash of color or plumage like you'd find here in the, uh, the bird of paradise. These are birds of paradise, and they do all kinds of interesting dances, and they have all kinds of colorful uh, displays but this bower bird i find to be just just like <laughs> the just the calm cool and collective approach and so what it does is it builds this bower it builds a home and it's really impressive and it's to uh, lure females into there to mate and it go and it, it goes further than that it, it actually brings fruit and seeds and flowers and it, it landscapes the whole house and so it creates this beautiful um home if you will, for the female. I actually, have, I, now that I remember, maybe I don't have it, um, but what you could do, I don't have it, um, sorry about that. What you could do is, um, again, YouTube Bowerbirds. There's a, a great video on YouTube by uh, the BBC uh, that shows how the bird go about goes about creating this home. And also Birds of Paradise are really cool too. And so maybe our most famous courtship uh, behavior that we can relate to is it's a fairly common is the peacock. The peacock is the male and, and it courts the pea hen, which is the female. And the peacock has this incredible tail. Look at this. It's so large and it's so colorful and it, and it dances and displays it. Now, you know, it's, it's dangerous being this conspicuous. It really is. I mean, it, it's not easy when a predator is coming to flee a predator when you got this massive tail. And so it really highlights one of the core principles of biology that it's that it's it's more important to to mate than it is is even to survive. I mean, I know those things kind of go hand in hand, but it's just just saying that they're really to go out on a limb in order to to mate, it's that important. And so natural selection, what what's up with these courtship behaviors? Well, you know, in the end, it's choosing a mate that is you know, going to be the best possible um, donor, if you will, uh, to your to the to the next generation. And so you want to pick the best genes. And the only way you can pick the best genes uh, to be in your offspring is is to choose phenotypes. So you're you're looking at physical morphology in the in the other gender, and you're also looking at some of the things that it does. And so you need to think about when you're when you're courting a mate someday in the future, what are some phenotypes that are qualities that you think are valuable in choosing a uh, a partner? And so again, here's those albatross that are um, smooching, and it, it leads to if if it's successful, it'll lead to copulation, which is another way way of saying sexual reproduction. So. It's a series of displays and movements, but it could either be by male or female, and that really depends. I mean, usually we think of the male as being the one that's very colorful, 
uh, more than the female, and that's called sexual dimorphism, where there's a differentiation between what a male looks like and a female, but it can be the, the reverse as well. And it, so these displays can either be by a male or female, and it depends on the mating system. And so that's something that we're going to need to discuss as well. And then finally, this courtship ritual, again, is also a classic. You may not be familiar with it unless you've been studying animal behavior. But this is our, our famous uh, male stickleback, three-fin stickleback. And you can tell it's male, not just because it has the male symbol there, but because it has a red belly. And so what <laughs> what's interesting about this is that it goes into this courtship ritual when it sees the female and what it what it's looking at is as sort of a stimulus sign stimulus is that it's looking at a swollen female so the, the female has to be really um, chubby if you will because she's swollen with eggs and so again the the male <laughs> doesn't even care like you could have you could do this in an aquarium and it and you could put in a a model of the female and it doesn't even have to look like a fish it, fish it just could be, be a round swollen object and the male starts going into this courtship ritual and what it does is it does this what's known as the z dance the zigzag dance so it's weaving in like this and then it starts pointing into like this crevice some sort of cave like a little alcove in the in this in the bottom of the tank or in the uh, wherever it wants. So it's saying, okay, female, go in there, go in there, go in there. And so the female then goes in there and then she lays her eggs in there and then he prods her and like, okay, get out. And so then the female goes out and then the, the male goes in there and um, releases sperm and then fertilizes the eggs inside. And so that's kind of unusual. So I wanted to point that out. And so what's interesting about, this is a sort of a transition between uh, mating systems and what and what I was just talking about in, in terms of parental investment you have to um, step back for a second and remove yourself from morality when it comes to parental investment because I know um, in our situation in terms of the human population we like to think that a monogamous relationship in other words pair bonding between the same male and female is best we often think that both male and female need to be present in order to raise the offspring. But the truth is, depends on what the situation is and what's best for different species. Uh, it could be a polygamous relationship or it could be more parental investment by the female than the male and it's perfectly fine. You can't really throw a moral judgment on it. I think moral judgment is one of those behaviors that we have in our society in order to encourage the parental investment that is best that serves humanity, which is a monogamous uh, relationship like that. So just wanted to point that out. So parental investment, keep your, keep your, uh, your, your mind open. And so it refers to the amount of time and resources that, uh, that the parent spends in raising the offspring. And so Generally speaking, it's it is lower in males and more in females, and we we don't know definitively why that is the case, but we sort of suspect that it might have to do with the fact that the female puts a lot of effort into creating a reproductive gamete, like an ova, like the egg, and so it sort of goes to follow that she'll want to invest a lot of parental t time into the the rearing of that offspring and then the converse of that or the or the is that the if the male produces so many gametes the sperm that it's really of less value and so there's not a lot of investment that goes into pr parenting but it will de it will deter depend and so let's get into this parental investment it's actually kind of an important idea in animal behavior and so Generally, again, most in most situations, it's the female that is choosing the mate. It's the female that needs to be most discriminating, if you will, the one that is choosing. Like if you think of a panel, uh, again, like uh, an American Idol or something, it's the it's the female that's sitting there judging the phenotype and the behavior. So this is a 
a picture again on the Galapagos Islands of uh, the male blue-footed booby. And so it, it, it goes with this, this big dance and the female, you know, either likes it or doesn't like it. And so the female basically is looking for the fit male. Now that, that's a big uh, quotation. What does this mean? Uh, it could be physical, could be strength, could be muscles, could be intelligent, could be disposition, could be a lot of things. Depends on what you like. But ultimately, by choosing the best phenotype, excuse me, choosing the best phenotype, you're choosing the best genes to, to go into the next generation. And so these mating behaviors and mate choices are rather important. Now, when I say mating behavior, it isn't just the act of the sexual reproduction. It's really all of these things. It's like seeking a male, trying to attract the opposite sex, and then choosing and even competing for, uh, for mates as, as part of this mating behavior. There's competition. Like you can see how these turkeys here, these male toms are going around waving their tail feathers and they're competing, if you will, for, for mates. And so all of this results from natural selection and something in particular, a subset of natural selection called sexual selection. So if you're a drab or you don't have an impressive tail, maybe the female isn't choosing you and so you're, you're pitiful tail is not going to get passed on in the next generation. If you, And so let's look at this. So the mating relationships between males and females will vary. Okay, I mentioned this. And so in one of the most common uh, mating systems is something called promiscuous. And so there's promiscuous means that there's no strong pair bonding. In other words, the relationship is not very strong. It doesn't last for very long. And so there's mating that goes on and then they're done. And they can go out and find other partners. And I, oh, I know that morality is saying don't do that. But in fact, promiscuous uh, uh, behavior is fairly common in other animals. And so when there is a monogamous, okay, that means one monogamous, in other words, one male, one female, they tend to stay together and there's what we'd call pair bonding. And when there's, when it's monogamous relationships, generally these are two goals. You can't hardly tell the difference between males and females. And so that's a characteristic of the fact that they're, they have similar morphology. In other words, similar external structure. Whereas in a poly polygamous relationship, that's where you see a lot of sexual dimorphism. Where, where the female is choosing uh, a male. So in the polygamous relationship, uh, as I was just saying, um, where it's one sex mating with several of the other, you get to see more sexual dimorphism. Like for example, in these, these seals, you can really tell the difference. Hmm, this is the male this giant guy right over here, and this is the female, which is really m much smaller in size. And so I uh, just wanted to point that out. Now, just to sort of close the book on this, like polygamous relationships where there's uh, one gender with many of the other, this can go both ways on this. Now, you could have two kinds of polygamous relationships. What are we talking about? Where, well, you could have something called polygynous, which poly means many, prefix gyne is a female, like, like a female physician is a gynecologist. So polygynous means one male, many females, in terms of a polygamous, or you could have polyandrous, and andro means male. And so you have, in other words, one female, many males, Okay, so th this is the two approaches that you can have. So polyandry, an if you will, the one where you have the f one, one female and many males is fairly rare, as it turns out. And in this situation, you do have sexual dimorphism, but huh, it's the female that's a little bit more showy in order to attract a, the male. So that's kind of a, an exception to the rule. And so this um, polygyny, in other words, one male and many female, many gyne, um, usually is what we're most typical, like you can see here in these elk, here, the, the, this is the male, because look at the, 
the uh, the horns here, and then the female the female lion and the male lion with the large mane. And so, it it really depends again on the situation. Don't cast a morality onto this. So it's really the needs of the young um, are an important factor when you're talking about mating systems. If the young are vulnerable and they take a long time like for example humans uh, it takes a, a long time many years before the child is capable of feeding itself or being able to walk if it's very vulnerable then that is a selection pressure for monogamous for staying together because both parents are needed to raise the offspring but if the the child is you know good to go as soon as it's born um, the truth is you don't really need to have pair bonding. And usually uh, the truth is if the male were to leave and that female can take care of the, the child, the male can go out and find a new partner. And so, but if the chicks, if you will, if the offspring need a lot of attention, it's better to stay together, like love right here. <laughs> and so again, like I was saying, the male can maximize its reproductive success by taking off and seeking additional mates like in this uh, many female example. This is the, uh, the male frigate bird on the Galapagos Islands with that big red pouch. And so parental uh, uncertainty um, is something of consideration too. Like if you know it's your child, you might be more invested in it. If you don't even know that it's your child, then why would you even care? And so it kind of is related to whether or not fertilization was internal fertilization where you could be ensured that this is your child but if you're just releasing eggs and releasing sperm like in a marine environment uh, and you don't even know if this is these are your children or not so you just take off <laughs> it's uh, and, you know again don't cast judgment on it it's just the way it is and so finally uh, I found this particular example to be an interesting one so I'm going to finish with this when females are choosing mates i remember as i was saying before what is it the what quality it, that you're looking at is it muscle is it intelligence is it plumage what are, what are these things is it the big pouch is it a big peacock tail what is it that you like and so really beauty is in the eye of the beholder because in these female ants what is it that they're looking for is that um, the, the female stock eyed flies they choose males based on how long they're these are the eyes on the ends of these stalks. So they're choosing males that have like the longest eye stalks. And, and apparently this has some kind of correlation between health and vitality, the length of the eye stalk. And so <laughs> there you have it. So it all depends. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed uh, this video on social behavior part one. I hope you uh, have an opportunity to view part two as well. I think you'll find it just as interesting or perhaps even more so. Thanks for watching.